Amen. Meet me there. And uh, my wife's going to have to put up with that song now again for another. Uh, I often sing that chorus, meet me there. And I just start singing it. And and um, and so I've not sang that here lately. And so she's just going to have to now put up with it again because we uh, sang it today. It'll come to mind all week. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, meet me there. Uh, meet me there. Amen. Uh, well, the junior church can be dismissed at this time uh, to uh, go downstairs. And uh, Miss Sarai's. Uh, teaching them they're going through the Ten Commandments be praying for them as they're uh, learning those she's coming up with crafts every week and also a song uh, to help them memorize all those and, uh, and so this uh, uh, meet uh, this uh, uh, the Ten Commandments important for them to be able to learn you know they're able to make you wise unto salvation and uh, so I just uh, thank Lord for uh, God just uh, giving Soraya ministry also there with them uh, we're in John chapter 15 uh, John chapter number 15 and here in John chapter 15 uh, a uh, well-known famous portion of scripture famous as far as uh, because of uh, the poetical form of it the illustration that is given just a wonderful picture of Jesus Christ uh, and uh, in Israel they were very familiar with vineyards and uh, with the, the vines and the branches and and of course as the uh, the uh, illustration is given Jesus Christ is the true vine and uh, we uh, as the branches uh, and uh, of course the uh, the illustration here uh, that's uh, that's used uh, the branches those that are saved uh, those that are saved are branches and uh, uh, and so he refers to here there's uh, there's uh, of course three different uh, or if you want to look at it four different classifications of, of saved people here there's those that are cut off the branch uh, there's those that are uh, just uh, hanging in the branch and there's those that are bearing fruit uh, in the branch and then there's those that are bearing much fruit uh, in the branch. And and uh, so just uh, four different classifications there uh, as uh, as Christians. We looked at it and noted uh, that uh, that uh, it's not speaking of salvation here, that uh, salvation means you're in the branch or in the vine, uh, but uh, rather uh, it's talking about fruit bearing. And as we looked at here, the vine and, uh, of course, uh, the uh, body of Christ, uh, the local church that God has uh, given us to be a part of. And and uh, God does uh, does uh, reach this world through the church. And he's, he's chosen to use the uh, the uh, church to uh, reach. The Bible says when you're saved, God's got a part and a plan for you in a, in a church. And and uh, of course, it speaks of the members of the church. And there's the uh, the uh, eyes and the ears and, and, and all those uh, you know, in in the church. But uh, some have taken this to teach salvation and they teach that if you don't bear fruit, God's going to cut you off and you're no longer uh, saved. You're no longer in the uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And and uh, of course, some have uh, taken that to teach that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that uh, when you are uh, baptized, you're baptized into Jesus Christ, you're baptized into the church, you're baptized as a Christian. Uh, and excommunication means you lose your salvation because you're cut off. There's all kinds of uh, teachings that people have taken this uh, this uh, to to begin to teach. And, and of course, scripture, uh, you don't need to compare scripture with scripture. God doesn't contradict himself. And and, and so if if uh, what you interpret a passage to mean uh, you have a problem with it fitting in scripture and others contradicting it, then you probably have the wrong interpretation. That's part of rightly interpreting the word of God. And uh, because the Bible does say the, the spiritual, they prove scripture with scripture. And and, and so as we uh, we look at this, it's not speaking of salvation uh, and uh, uh, but uh, rather uh, as uh, fruitfulness uh, as Christians. God desires every Christian to bear fruit. Uh, God desires every uh, every Christian to be a member of the body. And, and God desires every Christian to be a fruitful member of the body. Uh, we looked at. Uh, you know, and, and as, as we see this and uh, just one one scripture came to mind as I was uh, just considering here and, and we were looking at eternal security last uh, last week and and uh, how that you, you when, when he when he saved us, he gave us everlasting life. That's life that lasts forever. And it's not that hard to understand that uh, when he gives you everlasting life, he, he gives you life that will last forever and and uh, in salvation uh, and, and God makes it free. Uh, Jesus Christ paid it all. Uh, when he died on the cross, it's finished and he paid for all the sins of the whole world, the Bible says. Uh, and uh, and so uh, we, he's the propitiation for our sins, not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. And so he died for all uh, sins. He died for the world, all sinners. And and uh, when he when he went to the cross and he died for us, 
and he makes it free. Uh, why would he do that? Why would he make it so easy? Uh, well, the conclusion, he wants everyone to be safe. Uh, he wants everyone. He doesn't want to exclude anyone. Uh, he wants everyone uh, to be saved. And, and, uh, and so he's provided it for all, and he's paid it all. So it's, uh, again, uh, God's simple uh, plan of salvation. Uh, if you just come to Christ and, and, uh, and turn from, uh, from uh, you know, uh, repentance and, and trying to, to trust in religion and trust in yourself and, and everything else to get you to heaven and you just turn and put your trust in Christ and him only, uh, then the Bible says he'll save you. If you want to read these verses, we begin. Isaiah 55, 1 says this. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. And Jesus said in the New Testament, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's amazing what uh, you know, uh, the price that people will pay uh, for uh, for their religion, for their faith uh, in in Christ, and and uh, they uh, talk about their religion and how that they uh, they uh, uh, you know are willing to make all kinds of sacrifices and all kinds of things for their religion, even die for their religion, uh, and yet Jesus says, "If you'll come to me, uh, I will save you." And uh, and so uh, so ho, uh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, that includes everyone. That's why God has paid it all. Uh, and he's he's paid the price for us uh, to be saved. And and so as we look at uh, this uh, passage, not talking about salvation, but rather bearing fruit. Uh, well, we began looking at last week and and uh, to understand, uh, you know, just because you're hanging on the vine doesn't mean you'll bear fruit. Just because you're hanging on the vine doesn't mean that you'll bear fruit. And and, uh, you know, as we, we look at the vine and, of course, the body of Christ and and uh, here it, just because you are a member of a church doesn't mean you're going to bear fruit. Uh, you know, some may believe that uh, just because you, uh, you you are a member of the church and and uh, two preachers uh, or three preachers actually talking one time. And and uh, of course, they were, uh, you know, uh, just uh, these these old church buildings with the high, uh, you know, uh, uh, steeples in them. And and uh, anyway, one preacher is just talking about and, and they had the, the same same problem. And and uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, just uh, what to do because there's bats that were living up there. And, of course, as the singing would get, get going and such, well, the bats would begin moving around. And, and uh, you don't want bats in your church. And and, uh, and so, uh, you know, they're talking about what to do and how to do it. And, and you know, of course, one preacher, you know, get a uh, you get a gun, you try to shoot them. But, uh, you know, uh, they're pretty hard to shoot. And, and uh, you know, even if you get them, they keep coming back. And, and, uh, and of course, you know, just different, uh, different ways to do it. One preacher says, well, I, I was able to get rid of all of our bats. And he says, how would you do that? He said, I baptized them. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that think, well, I, I'm saved and I got baptized into the church. I'm a member of the church. And so, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's it. I mean, I'll just wait to get to heaven and, and on with my life. And they're on their, uh, on their way. They've, they've met the requirements or whatever. And, and uh, uh, you know, you, you can say that, but the, the, it's true in many cases. Uh, I, I've, you know, seen it here even, even in, in Coquille that, uh, you know, there's people that will, uh, you know, uh, come and, 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 and at least it, it appears as if they've they've made a testimony of faith in Christ. There's evidence in, in their life and things. And and uh, they come and get baptized. You never see them again. Uh, and and why they've uh, they've uh, fulfilled the requirements of members of the church. Uh, and uh, back in in uh, uh, in Missouri, uh, just notice there and in, in a lot of the uh, the uh, Baptist churches, they have membership roles and they have people that haven't been to church for 40, 50 years, but they're still members of that church. And when they talk about, you know, the membership of the church and they include, uh, you know, them in it. And and uh, the, of course, this church, when it started, uh, you know, as uh, after three months of not attending, you're you're now inactive. After six months, you're no longer a member. Uh, very easy to come back and join again. You come back and let them know you, uh, you know, you've uh, you've just, uh, you know, uh, turned back to the uh, to following the Lord. And you want to be a part of the church again. And and uh, of course, uh, bring you for the church and you're back as a member of the church, but uh, but uh, just to, to, to be able to take care of it. But there's some people think, you know, I'm, I'm a member of such and such church. And and, uh, and so that's what being a Christian is. Uh, that's what being a Christian is. And, and, you know, the Bible mentions Jesus speaks of those that just hang on the vine. 
Uh, those that are just uh, and and if we're not careful as Christians, sometimes you say, well, I'm just uh, there, there's a lot of, uh, of people that just go to church Sunday morning and, and, and they're completely content uh, just going, you know, just coming Sunday morning. That's a start. Uh, you know, I, I'd encourage you to come to Sunday school. Uh, Sunday school is for adults, too. Uh, I know a lot of times people have this mentality. Well, Sunday school, that's for kids. Uh, you know, uh, Sunday school is, is for adults, too. And and uh, uh, and and we, uh, you know, taking right now, we're going through the reign of David and and uh, some lessons on uh, David. And we, this morning we we're just dealing with, uh, you know, be careful about your heart getting hardened because uh, we try to reach people in this world. Uh, you know, the, you, you'll experience, uh, you know, some some mistreatment when you try to uh, to to be a blessing and and uh, and things. And it's very easy for Christian to get their heart hardened. And and uh, but uh, but, uh, you know, come to Sunday school, Sunday night service. Uh, you know, it's, it's important that we. Uh, you know, our, our uh, you know, I encourage you. Uh, there's more than just Sunday morning, uh, Wednesday night. Uh, and, uh, you know, just uh, just a burden of fresh about, uh, you know, the Bible. Uh, the Bible says Jesus said that his house was to be known as the house of prayer. But in churches today, when do you pray? Uh, a few minutes before the service, a few minutes at the end of the service. Uh, and uh, Wednesday night prayer service is important. Uh, as we uh, take prayer requests and not only uh, pray uh, together for a, a while here at, at church, but also uh, to be uh, praying one for another uh, throughout the week and and uh, just uh, being able to uh, to be aware of the needs and things. And and uh, as we as we uh, do. But, uh, you know, again, uh, there's people that say, well, I'm faithful Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Wednesday night. Well, I've been taught to do that. Uh, I've been taught to I was brought up doing that. And so I do that. And and, uh, you know, I, I come and. And uh, I fulfilled my duty. Uh, I've gone to church. You know, that's still to me just hanging on the vine. Uh, that's still, uh, you know, hanging on the vine. Uh, you maybe have your spot in your pew and your name's not really there. But uh, if you were to realize when you're not here, nobody sits in your spot. Uh, nobody sits in your spot. Uh, Why? Wow, that's your spot. It'd be kind of uh, kind of interesting sometime if you'd have, uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, uh, just go ahead and sit in somebody else's spot. See if the message sounds different. Uh, you know, and, and whatever but we do, we kind of, uh, you know, as as a family, we kind of come in just like at the table. Uh, a lot of times, Uriah and Rain, and they, uh, they 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 they'll run us. Can I sit in Pastor's chair? Uh, pastor's got a chair all of a sudden. I never had one before, but uh, you know, I guess they kind of notice that there's one that I, uh, you know, uh, sit in or whatever. And can I sit? And so they fight over who gets to sit in fat Pastor's chair, and and uh, you know, and it's like, well, I'm going to sit in my chair. Uh, oh, okay, and. So now it's become, you know, my chair. But, uh, you know, I w- wonder what it would be like if you actually came and sat in Miss Darlene's spot. She'd probably come tell you to move, but no, uh, she wouldn't do that. Uh, you know, uh, Bud would. He says, oh, my wife sits there. But uh, it kind of mixed things wh- up, wouldn't it? And, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, if we're not careful, we just begin to kind of hang on the vine. Uh, we kind of go through the motions, the things that we've learned to do, which are, uh, it, it's a right habit. It's a good habit to go to church. I encourage you have that habit. Keep up that habit. There's good habits. There's bad habits. Certainly worse habits you could have. Uh, but if you're not careful, it just becomes a habit. And uh, you're, you're just hanging uh, there on the vine. And and uh, and yet. Uh, all of a sudden, the fruit will begin to dwindle. Uh, and uh, pretty soon the, the fruit will will be gone. And uh, but you can say in the back of your mind to comfort yourself. But I'm faithful in church. I'm faithful in church. And uh, and so here uh, we find Jesus. You know, the Bible speaks of the father. He comes and it says uh, in uh, verse number two, every branch in me that beareth not fruit. He taketh away. I mean, it's just it's just hanging there. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and, and of course, we we know that there's, you know, uh, those at one time, they, uh, you know, just faithful and growing and and uh, uh, pretty soon just uh, just, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, hanging and, and, and then uh, not very long that uh, all of a sudden where, uh, you know, uh, where's the fruit in their life today? Uh, coming to church is not the fruit. Uh, coming to church is to, uh, you know, uh, get the fruit, but it's not the fruit. Uh, and uh, we, we think sometimes, well, if we, uh, you know, uh, we get a big crowd to come to church, well, then the church has a lot of fruit. That's not the fruit uh, of our lives. And uh, Jesus is the one that builds the, the church. But, uh, you know, as we uh, we, we get to, to, to think, well, that is the fruit of the Christian life to go to church. Singing and worshiping the Lord while you're at church. Well, that's fruit. But, you know, there's a lot of fruit that is born through our lives outside the walls of this building. Uh, we come together to fellowship, and be encouraged to go out into that world and bear fruit. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, every one of us have many ministries in our life. Uh, God's called some of us to be fathers, and God's called some of us to be husbands or wives, and, and uh, God has, uh, has called us to uh, have a mission field at a place that we work and, and different talents and abilities and things. God's called us to live in a family, and, and uh, God's called us to be sons and daughters. And, and I mean, there's, there's, there's many different ministries. God's called us to be a neighbor, and God's called us to be a, a citizen of our community. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's lots of different ministries God's given every one of us. And he wants us to bear fruit in every one of those situations. And and so uh, uh, so it, it, it's not by just hanging on the uh, the vine that you bear fruit. Uh, but I would like to look here as we look at this three conditions uh, that he gives uh, three other conditions of bearing fruit. Uh, three other conditions. Just hanging in the vine is not going to bear uh, fruit. Uh, definitely hanging in the vine is necessary uh, that we might produce fruit. But. A hanging vine uh, by itself is not going to bear fruit. The Bible says these branches that the father comes and and they're not bearing fruit. And of course, he uh, he removes them. And and so uh, three other conditions to uh, bearing uh, fruit. I'd like you to notice verse number four. Verse number four, the Bible says, abide in me. And I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. But without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this morning. And Lord, I, uh, I do believe that... Uh, we're here this morning because we want to be fruit bearing Christians. Uh, Lord, as we uh, just look at uh, this uh, illustration you've given to understand the, uh, the uh, grapevine and uh, the uh, branches and, and the grapes, the fruit, and uh, of course the husbandman, uh, your father. Uh, Lord, I, I just pray that you would bless the message this morning and, and uh, Lord, just refresh uh, our uh, walk with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Conditions of bearing fruit. Number one, to abide in Christ. To abide in Christ. What does it mean to abide in Christ? Probably the best and simplest definition, just put in a few words. If you want a proverb uh, there, uh, just a, a short saying to uh, define abiding in Christ. To be Christ dependent. To be Christ dependent. Uh, those which abide in the vine are Christ dependent. Uh, look at Philippians chapter number four. Philippians chapter number four. I believe Paul was Christ dependent. That's why he had so much fruit in his life. Uh, Philippians chapter number four. And a good example in his his relationship with Christ would be for us here in Philippians chapter four. To be Christ dependent. Look at verse number 13. There's uh, two themes that have been given in, in our time it's kind of affected generations but one of those is the power of positive thinking the power of positive thinking and and uh, uh, the second one is self-esteem uh, the power of self-esteem uh, and uh, of course uh, paul he he eliminates both of those as uh, being the results of fruitfulness uh, verse 13 says i can do all things through christ which strengtheneth me in other words, he says, I'm Christ dependent. I'm Christ dependent. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Are there some things you could do without Jesus Christ? There are, aren't they? In fact, before you got saved, uh, I assume that, you know, uh, uh, when God came to you and saved you, there was lots of things you could do. Didn't you have talents and abilities before you got saved? Uh, didn't you have energy and as Paul said, to will is present with me. Didn't you have a will? Uh, maybe you were good at your job before you got saved. Uh, maybe you did good in school. You had a brain before you got saved. 
uh, you were smart. Uh, maybe you had physical ability before you got saved. In fact, some people, before they got saved, they had great physical ability. After they got saved, to somewhere along in life, they got uh, handicapped. And uh, you can say, I could do b- more before I got saved than after I got saved. And physically, I was more fit. And, uh, you know, uh, I expect that most of you were younger than when you got saved. And so you had more energy when you got saved. So I could do all kinds of things. But, you know, we have revealed here Paul's heart. He says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And in fact, we find Paul saying in, in uh, 2 Corinthians, he says, where I am weak, there is he strong. Therefore, I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. And, uh, uh, you know, those, those weaknesses that I have, those things that I can't do, that's where God comes in and he begins to really do something. And, uh, and to, to abide in Christ, to be Christ dependent. <clears throat> There's probably some things in your life that when you began to do them, you were a little bit nervous when you started to do them. Uh, and, and it may have even been a step of faith. I mean, you had to step out in faith to start to do it. But, you know, after you did it for a while, you weren't nervous anymore. I mean, it just worked out, didn't it? And after you did it, you know, for a while, you said, well, there's really not any faith in this at all. Uh, I did it yesterday. I'm going to do it again today. I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, I think of things like faith promise giving. We talk about faith promise giving. Uh, well, you gave to faith promise giving last year and you gave that much and and uh, you were nervous about it. Uh, I, I can be rem- remember a time that I was nervous about giving $50 a month to faith promise giving. $50 a month. Uh, and uh, I'm not nervous about that today. I mean, that's been, <coughs> well, I don't want to say how many years, but a, a long time ago. And uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, and God has always met the need. And, and in fact, it's just, you know, that, that's easy. Give him $50 a month. Uh, and, uh, you know, but at the time, it was a real step of faith. And I had to pray and say, God, could you please take care of me? And meet my needs. I'm going to give this, and I'm going to trust you with this. And it's like, Lord, here, you know, uh, no problem. <clears throat> God blesses those that give. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Keep down, press together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. And, and so the longer you give to the Lord, and <clears throat> the tithe, that is a struggle for many Christians, to give the tithe. And, and uh, you know, how am I going to make it? I mean, uh, you know, if I give 10 percent of of what I make to the Lord and and, uh, you know, it was a real step of faith. Soul winning. Well, not witnessing. I still get nervous about that. But uh, but, you know, maybe you don't. I don't know. But uh, but uh, going out and and uh, talking to people about the Lord and you didn't know a lot of scripture and 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 you really hadn't talked to anybody about the Lord before. And I mean, you were just uh, it was scary. Now you're just kind of nervous about their response. But, uh, you know, you, you, you memorize some scriptures and and uh, you just kind of have a, 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 a you know, a, a, a routine that you can go through and witnessing to somebody. And and uh, and so, uh, you know, but there for a time and it was it was really it had to be God working through you to accomplish, to get you to move your feet, to go out and talk to people uh, about the Lord, teaching that Sunday school class. Uh, doing those openings, Brother Bob. There was a time you got nervous about it, wasn't there? I'm using you as an example because of that. Uh, my wife said she enjoys Bob's openings. She can, she, she, she just because he's so sincere about it. And, uh, uh, you know, the time will come, you'll get comfortable at it, maybe. And uh, because you've done it before, maybe you'll even get a whole history of, of uh, uh, openings that you've done. And uh, so you can just, uh, you know, one for every week of the year. So somebody asks you, you know, you want to be super Sunday school superintendent this year? Oh, no problem. I got them all worked out. Uh, you know, a few minutes on my way to church. Let my wife drive and I'll, uh, you know, get them and get there. And, yeah, we'll go through and do this. And I've done this one before and it's it, it's easy. And uh, But then you wonder why the difference? Why aren't people responding to it anymore? Uh, well, because Bob's doing it now. It's not the Lord anymore. Uh, you've got this all worked out. Uh, now it's, uh, you know, uh, it's no longer the Lord freshly giving you the, the illustration that you had to pray over and, and uh, you know, uh, be concerned about as you gave it. But now it's you already got it down in print. 
You know, boy, this is easy. I've done it before. And, and uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and as we uh, go along as Christians, then we can become unfruitful because we no longer are God dependent. We're no longer depending on Christ. Husbands he, leading their homes, raising their children, taking care of their wife. You know, a new husband, that's a scary thing, isn't it? A blessing, but it's a scary thing. It's a lot of responsibility. And all of a sudden, it's not just you, and you can't just go out and mess around and, and uh, live on the street if you have to. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're in a tent someplace, but now there's responsibility there. And, and the times that you sought the Lord and prayed, God, help me be a good husband and help me be a good dad and have, uh, uh, you know, wisdom. And But after you do it for years, and, and uh, you know, the problem is, is, is uh, it just kind of becomes not to uh, uh, make it negative, but becomes old hat, uh, you know, just uh, uh, comfortable. Uh, no longer abiding in Christ, no longer depending upon that vine to uh, work through you to bear that fruit. But now it's just do it like you've always done it. Bible says here, he says, if you'll abide in me and I in you, he says, you'll bear much fruit. You know, that that branch, it depends upon that vine to give all that it needs to that vine to be able to put those grapes on the end of it. Uh, and that branch knows that if it's not a part of that vine, then uh, I kind of wonder sometimes in my life if if I was to if Christ wasn't to show up. Now, I understand he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But if Christ wasn't to show up, if I still could do just as good a job. And that's the problem. Because I could. But you know, I could do so much more better than I am if I depend upon Christ. Christ has taught me and Christ has brought me along and Christ has given me the ability. And, and uh, uh, you know, I did it yesterday. I can do it again today. And, and, uh, and so I, I, I'm not as dependent upon Christ as I once was. I first started preaching. Fear and trembling, every message. Lord, what what am I going to preach today? But you know, after a while, the messages, they I mean, you just kind of read a verse of Scripture and you can see there's, there's a message in there someplace. And... and uh, the temptation would be just to take that uh, that message and, and go ahead and, and preach it. Uh, the problem is, is it didn't become a part of me first. God didn't get to work it through me. I didn't spend the time in prayer and meditation and, and uh, allowing the Holy Spirit of God to deal with me first. And so I stopped growing. And uh, just uh, came to a point, and that's the, the best it's ever going to get. And so because of that, I wonder, where's, where's the fruit? Uh, where's the fruit? At your job, uh, maybe you've done the same job for 20 years, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, you first started that job, you were a little bit nervous about doing that job. And so as a Christian, there's times you had to pray and ask God to help you do a good job uh, and to understand your job and, and uh, uh, you know, those things. But, but you've kind of arrived now. Your job hasn't gotten any better than the last four or five years, but it's not bad. Still doing a good job. In fact, maybe people will tell you you do a good job, but uh, how much more uh, we could be or do if we were still dependent upon Christ. And the truth is, is usually you, you come up to a plateau and, and, and you're happy where you're at, and, and so you're not depending on Christ like you once did, and, and the truth is you don't stay up there, but you do come down some. And... Uh, uh, you know, in our life, as we step out by faith and in growth, uh, those things that used to scare us to death, we had to trust in God for. Uh, now we've learned how to do them. And so we don't find ourselves in prayer as much, and we don't find ourselves uh, dependent upon Christ like we once were. And so the fruit's kind of dried up on the vine because the branches aren't abiding. Albert Barnes, he says this, remain united uh, as definition of, of abide. Remain united to me by a living faith. 
Live a life of dependence on me and obey my doctrines, imitate my example, and constantly exercise faith in me. Uh, so again, still meeting the, the uh, simple definition of to be Christ dependent. Galatians 2, Paul said this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The life that he lived, he lived by Jesus Christ. To have that understanding and that relationship with Christ where you're dependent upon your walk with him. You're dependent upon that relationship with him. It's not just a part of your life. It is your life. He said in Philippians 121 for to me. Should be for me, too, but he says for to me. To live is Christ. And to die is. Is gain. He's just revealing a little bit of his heart there to the Philippians. He says, for to me. To live is Christ. And to die is gain. Uh, I mean, every day for me to to live, I'm his servant. And uh, dependent upon him and waiting upon him and and uh, to me to, to live is Christ and to die is gain while well, I get to see him. You know, it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, for every day, I, my, my purpose in my day is Christ. And uh, one day I'm looking forward to death so that I can see him face to face and be with him. The song, I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Has there been times like that in your life? Is that how it is today? That you're dependent upon Jesus Christ to even get through the day. You realize that nothing eternal is going to take place in your day, in your life, if you're not dependent upon him. Oh, you may accomplish some temporary things. You may accomplish some things in this world. And, and uh, uh, you may have talent and ability and energy to do some things, but not like you do them if you were dependent upon Christ. Are you dependent upon him? Well, we could have an invitation right now. Just. Adding to those here in John chapter number 15. And he mentions some other things that would also be a part of bearing much fruit. John chapter 15, I'd like you to notice. He says in verse number seven. If you abide in me, we looked at the condition, abide in Christ, be Christ dependent. And then notice here, the, the Bible goes on to say, verse seven, if you abide in me, then he adds to that. And my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. And we talked about this back with the sower and and I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of detail at this time, but uh, just briefly to mention, the Bible says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Then you can ask what you will and it'll be done unto you. Uh, if you abide in me and my words abide. In you. Look at that. Secondly, we need a, a, a diet of the word of God, a regular diet of the word of God. We don't like that word diet, do we? Uh, but. Uh, we need, uh, you know, the, the word of God. Most of us, when we eat dinner, uh, want some meat on the plate. And I know maybe there's some vegetarians here today or whatever that don't like meat. But most time, most dishes, there's got to be some meat in something uh, when, you, uh, when you eat dinner. But, uh, you know, as uh, uh, we think of everything we do, there's, there's got to be the word of God in it. 
constant diet of the word of God. James 1.21 says, Wherefore, lay ap apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. And, and uh, you know, we're, uh, sometimes we're trying to memorize scripture, but when he talks about the engrafted word, it's not just the memorizing of scripture, uh, but it's natural. That which is engrafted, it's, it's natural. Uh, if you really want to, uh, not naturally there, but it's naturally engrafted there, so that if you've got an arm that's engrafted and, and uh, uh, you know, upon your body, then it responds just like the regular arm would. You don't even have to think about it. Arm move. Uh, well, it's not really engrafted. That's what they call, uh, what's those fake arms? That, uh, prosthesis? Uh, the difference between engrafted, uh, you know, to actually have an a, uh, arm. Uh, Miss Brenda, what's the word I'm looking for? Not engrafted, tran not transplant, but uh, yeah, arm transplant. Would that be an arm transplant? You actually got a live arm. It's engrafted. And uh, uh, you know that the word of God would become like that in us. We, we don't have to, s to quote chapter and verse. We just live it. Uh, you know, as we, uh, uh, you know, are regular into the preaching and teaching of God's word and we're doing our devotions and reading the Bible, we just begin to act like a Christian. We begin to act like Christ. And before I make a decision, I don't have to s quote chapter and verse. I just do it. Because it comes natural. Why? Because the word of God is now in me. It's become such a part of me. It's amazing to me. You don't got a regular diet of the, the, the word of God. And, and uh, pretty soon then, uh, you know, you, you uh, uh, begin to naturally act like the, the, the last man. Uh, the Bible speaks of walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Uh, and yet we know if you feed that flesh, then, uh, then you're going you're gonna to follow the old nature and the old man rather than uh, the, the the spirit of God and and uh, we need to walk in the spirit. We not fulfill the lusts of the flesh and and, and His word. Matthew four four, Jesus said, "It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God." We definitely need bread to live, don't we? But not bread alone. Something else we need regularly in our diet, and that's the word of God. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And it never stops coming a time that you don't need it. Job 23, verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. It is surprising we get away from the word of God how quickly we forget the instructions of God. And... Uh, how often do we eat? It's kind of amazing. You eat breakfast and you're hungry for lunch. Are you hungry right now? It's getting close to lunch. Didn't you have breakfast today? Some of you maybe didn't. I always have breakfast, but uh, maybe you didn't have breakfast today. That's a problem. But, uh, you know, uh, it's just surprising. But when it comes to the word of God, we say, well, I, I ate once this week. Well, wouldn't that be great if that's the way it was with food? Eat once this week, we'd all have a... a, 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 a uh, what would you call that, a, a sharp physique or whatever, you know. Uh, wouldn't have a, a problems that we do, but, uh, you know, this body it says, no, I'm hungry again, I'm hungry again. It does it three times a day. I pick on the, the boys and say, you know, they, and we, we count it up. They eat at least a minimum of six times a day. And uh, just to can't, it's just amazing. Uh, they eat double I eat. And uh, six times a day. My kids never ate like that, but, uh, but as, as, you know, it just... Uh, Energy shows it, too. Uh, wouldn't it be something if we were a Christian like that? Uh, had to eat six times a day. Can you imagine spiritually? Uh, it wouldn't be that we have to quote chapter and verse. It would just be a part of us. We just naturally act like a Christian. Uh, it's supposed to be our nature. We're saved, born again, children of God. And it's supposed to be a part of our nature, but we, we lack our diets. It says, if, if, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Uh, and then, number three, he says it first, save it for last. The Bible says here in verse number two, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Notice here, in every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And then verse 3, he says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Uh, sounds kind of out, out of place there when he says that, but what's he, what, what's he talking about? 
Uh, well, remember Jesus as he sat down with his disciples and he had the Last Supper. And, and as uh, they did, he got up from the table and he took his garment off and he girded himself. And the Bible says that he uh, he took the, the, the bowl of water and, and uh, he took the rag and he began to wash their feet. And he came to Peter and, and uh, Peter says, no, Lord, not my feet. And he says, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, I have no part. I mean, wash you. I have no part with you. And he says, then all of me had everything. And he told him, he says, Peter, you've already been washed. You just have need of your feet being washed. And, of course, the G- Jesus was teaching the, the illustration there he was given. Uh, you know, as, as Christians, we've been washed. Uh, we, we've been cleansed and and uh, uh, our sins are gone. But we walk out in this wicked world and we tend to pick up some dirt on our feet. And we need to regularly have our feet washed. Otherwise, we track it in the house with us. And. Uh, doesn't mean that that dirt enters inside of us and we become sinners again that are lost, but uh, but it definitely attaches itself to us, doesn't it? You ever been out on those uh, those uh, days in the rain and you're in the clay and you just get taller and taller and taller and taller? Uh, you know, and, and uh, as you're getting taller and taller and taller, it's getting harder and harder to walk. And boy, these boots are heavy, aren't they? Uh, why? Because you're getting all that mud and stuff on you. Makes it harder to work, doesn't it? Slippery and everything else that takes place as a result. The Bible says those branches that bear fruit, he purges them. I looked up on on pruning uh, the uh, grape vines, and and they just talk about the branches that come off of there that uh, that uh, they have a, a a few years of productivity, but uh, then uh, the uh, the uh, wood and whatever gets old and it's, it's, it's harder and harder for that sap and stuff to or whatever it is in the grapevine, uh, you know, to, to uh, go through to the branches. And, and so you have to prune those grapevines. And, uh, and, and, and so in pruning them, you have to cut off the, the, the branches that are, you know, out of the way, wild ones and, and whatever. And so I can just kind of picture the illustration here. And, and he says, and when you, when, you, when you prune those branches that are bearing fruit, he says you need to cut off as much of that old wood as you can. Uh, why? Because it it it, uh, it inhibits it inhibit no prohibits. Anyway, it stops the, uh, the 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 vine from producing grapes. It slows it down, and so you need to cut as much of that old wood off. You know, when I read that, I pictured a bunch of old Christians, a bunch of old Christians, and I'm not talking about cutting you off, okay? But uh, uh, you know, don't don't uh, you know think that. But uh, old Christians, I'm talking about people that have been saved for a lot of years. When you first get saved, you're excited about the Lord and, and uh, uh, there's there's uh, you know, you're willing to do anything. And everybody's noticing what happened to them. Boy, they changed. You even sang loud when you sang in church. Remember those days? I'm not picking on anybody in particular, but. Uh, you talk to everybody about the Lord. There are times people coming up and saying, you're a Christian, aren't you? Why? Well, I can tell by the vocabulary you're using, uh, you know, and and uh, you're using all these Bible terms and things. And you're just excited about the Lord and, and excited about, uh, you know, a fellowshipping with Christians and all those things. And uh, but, you know, after a while, we get some old wood. So we're not bearing the fruit that we once did. And and uh, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, we, we we get kind of. We stop abiding in Christ. And. Uh, we're more just hanging on the branch if we're on the or in the on the vine if we're even on the vine at all. The branch needs to be purged. He says those that bear fruit to uh, to purge it. Matthew sixteen twenty four. The Bible says then said Jesus and his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If you look in the Gospels, three times that Jesus had to come back to Peter in the boat. He's back in the boat fishing again. The Bible says there that he left his nets. He left the boat to follow Jesus. And then what happens? Jesus comes back and he's there in the boat again. That's when he says to launch out uh, away from the shore so that I can preach to the people here. And and uh, and then, of course, at the end, as as, uh, he's forsaken the Lord and now the Lord's uh, dead, buried, risen again. And and uh, and so where does he find Peter back out fishing again? Uh, Those fish were an attachment to him, weren't they? That was his business, his livelihood. God had called him to be a preacher, and he called him to leave that. And and uh, yet, it just kind of, uh, you know, uh, we we uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of get back into those things that we we once had. And 
And uh, it's amazing in our life and our energy and our time. The older we get, the less energy we got. It takes us longer to do things. Uh, and, uh, you know, as we get kind of to be some old wood, uh, the Bible says to, to be purged, that uh, we begin to uh, accumulate. Uh, now you've got to not only fix the roof on your house, you've got to fix the, rid on your, the roof on your storage shed. When you first came to the Lord, you didn't have enough stuff to put in a storage shed. But now you do. Uh, we've accumulated a lot of stuff, haven't we? We've also accumulated a lot of habits, a lot of things in our life. So we just don't have energy and time and effort to give to the Lord. And so we're not bearing much fruit. We don't have time to read our Bible like we once did. We don't have time to spend in prayer like we once did. Uh, we don't have time in a day to think about ministering and helping other people. we got so much to take care of ourselves, don't we? It says to prune it. Just some statements that were said. No men do more harm to themselves than they that love themselves more than God. Uh, that just kind of happens as we get older in life. Not that we go around, <laughs> I just love myself. No, that's not what it's. It's talking about taking care of yourself, of, of uh, worried about your own self and your pleasures and your joys and me time. Uh, rather than being, for me, for to me to live as Christ and to die as gain, I didn't mean to. Kiss myself so quick right in the mic. I forget that thing sticks out there. So apologize for that if it hurts your ears. But uh, it says, let him surrender to God his will, affections, body, and soul. Let him not seek his own happiness as the supreme object, but be willing to renounce all and lay down his life also if required. Another statement, abstain from all indulgences which stand in the way of duty. We begin to build up through a lifetime these things that we like and these things that we enjoy. And, and, uh, uh, and the, the, the more we like and the more we enjoy, the stronger the attachment to those things that, uh, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And I'm, I, I'm classified with the old now. We're getting there, so I'm not picking on anyone in particular. But, uh, you know, we, we get some habits and things that we build up through a lifetime. And we're not about to give those things up because God asked us to do something. Where God is trying to, to do something in our life. And so we get a lot of weights and things in our life. Here another statement. To put off our natural affections towards the good things of this life. Let them be pleasures, profit, honors, relations, life, or anything which would keep us from our obedience to the will of God. It's a strong statement to think of. Proverbs 132 says this. You can write it down. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them. If you look at the context, the turning away, it means they come to hit the hard things and they turn away to the easier path, the easier things. So the turning away of the simple shall, shall slay them. It says here, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. The prosperity. Uh, it was Solomon's prosperity that destroyed him. He started out, his, he, he was God-dependent. He received the kingdom. He came to God, and he says, God, uh, you know, he says, ask me anything, I'll give it to you. He says, I just need to have the wisdom to be able to rightly govern your people. Uh, boy, this is an awesome responsibility to be a king over a kingdom responsible for all these people. But, you know, in the end of his life, they were telling, uh, in fact, his, his death, they were telling Rehoboam, listen, if you'll lighten the load, your, your dad, he kind of went overboard, didn't he? Boy, the taxes and, and the things that he put upon us and, and uh, started out well. Purging. When you got saved, God had to purge a lot of things, didn't he? Uh, when I got saved and, and uh, more so when I rededicated my life because I picked up a lot of this world's filth and, and uh, I, I didn't grow up in, in church and that's not an excuse, uh, but... Uh, but uh, when I uh, rededicated my life, Lord, I remember more than when I uh, got saved. But God had to purge a lot. Uh, I mean, it seemed like I was under constant conviction. 
get rid of one thing in your life and get one thing straight out of your life and then all of a sudden there's something else and there's something else. Sometimes there'll be two things at a time. Uh, but, you know, we get to a place where uh, we've grown, we're at a plateau and we just kind of start relaxing and it's amazing how we start to pick up some of those things that we one time purged uh, or that God purged out of our lives. Because it's him that does it. He brings the conviction and he's the one that's got to give us the strength to overcome it. But um, that wood kind of gets hard. And it stops um, getting that sap through it. And, and so pretty soon, instead of a great big cluster of grapes, there's uh, a small cluster. And there's a smaller cluster and a smaller cluster. And, uh, after a while, there's no grapes at all. Conditions of fruitfulness. Abiding in Christ. I believe that's number one. Abiding in Christ, being Christ dependent. We can't do anything without Christ. It really matters. I understand we can do some things without Christ, can't we? But really we can't. He's the one that gives us the breath, and he's the one that causes our heart to beat, and he's the one in control of all things. And, and uh, uh, But without uh, us being dependent upon Christ, uh, there's some things we might think that we can do. Uh, are we Christ dependent? Is there a time that you need God's help to do the things in your life? And, but now you've just learned how to do it. Let's stand as we have the invitation. Regular diet of his word. Let's spend time in God's word this week. Purge him. There might be some things in our life that we've now justified. At one time we got rid of them. But, you know, they just have a way of creeping back in, picking up that dirt back on our feet. And we need to wash our feet again. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this message today. And, Lord, I, I mean to be Christ-dependent. I mean to be dependent upon your Son, to abide in your Son, Jesus. Uh, yet, Lord, I, I know that Often I'm not. There's a lot of things I've just learned how to do and and do them without even looking to you for help or guidance. I've done them before. And Lord, I uh, I just pray that you would work in our hearts afresh, that you might be refreshed. Get rid of some of that old wood. Refresh in our walk with you and our dependence upon you. Lord, your word would be engrafted, become such a part of us, would naturally just flow out of us. I pray, Father, that you would uh, bless this invitation, the desire to be fruitful Christians, fruitful branches. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.